So I'll let uh, Dave get us adjusted here. And as you know, you know, we're doing a show about physics. And uh, so I was going to wear my physics tie that I bought for our thermonuclear fusion show. And I looked at it this morning and I realized, you know what, that's more of a nuclear weapons tie. <laughs> so I'm going to just put it aside for now. Welcome to another edition of Next People Science Tomorrow, Southern California Public Radio's ongoing series of live events that explore, as you heard from Janice, how science shapes our lives, our civilization, and sometimes, as in the case uh, of this evening, even our universe. We've got another absolutely wonderful topic and uh, two perfect guests who are joining us to help explore it this evening. Uh, now, hovering over our conversation this evening will be the spirit of the man whom Time Magazine declared the most important human of the 20th century. We've got a, another beautiful shot of him that I think we're going to bring up here. There he is. Isn't that a great portrait? That's just amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I think he's uh, the perfect candidate. I mean, yeah, you know, there are some other people they could have chosen, FDR, Churchill. I, who would be better? Who has a greater legacy than, than this guy? Uh, so I couldn't agree more with Time Magazine's choice. He's been one of my heroes at least since middle school. This is the, the second time that those gentle eyes have overseen a next discussion. Albert was also here in spirit, I'd like to think, when we had a wonderful conversation uh, a little while back about science and religion. Uh, let me show you a great example of the degree to which he has become part of our culture. Just this morning, I did a double take when I was about to walk into a local convenience store, and this is what I saw. <laughs> it's right outside the, uh, the door of the store. So there you go. Now, I, I don't want to disappoint anyone, but as Janice said, we are not here, at least not primarily, to teach you how relativity works. Our theme is how Einstein's special and general theories changed our understanding of everything, <laughs> uh, including ourselves, and how they are woven into our daily lives. So if you leave here wanting to know more uh, of the conceptual details of relativity itself, there's a book I can recommend. It's called What is Relativity? And it is the latest creative output from our first guest, who I'm going to welcome up in a moment. Jeffrey Bennett has dedicated his life to bringing human understanding up to the level of human knowledge. An astronomer by training and experience, Jeff has a PhD in astrophysics. He is the co-author of The Cosmic Perspective, which uh, some of you in here may remember as one of your textbooks. It's the world's most popular introductory astronomy textbook. It's in its seventh edition now. His book, Life in the Universe, was co-written with Seth Shostak, a name that probably many of you also know of the SETI Institute. And, and here is one of Jeff's award-winning science books for kids, right there. This one is Max Goes to Mars. There's a whole series of these. Uh, up in a, there in a moment, you're going to see another one of them in the weightless hands of astronaut Koichi Wakata. That's aboard the International Space Station. Some of you may recognize the cupola the uh, most popular spot to hang out on the ISS. All of the Max the Dog science books have been read to children from orbit, which is what a, one hell of a thing to be proud of, Jeff. Uh, Jeff's big kids science organization has put tens of thousands of books in the hands of kids. He's here today as part of his year-long relativity tour, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, he's been sharing the wonders of relativity with curious, science-loving audiences from Hawaii to Florida. Please help me welcome Jeff Bennett. Thank you very much. Good to have you up here, Jeff. We'll got uh, Dave get your uh, microphone uh, all adjusted there. So um, the relatively tour is taking place across, whoops, across 2015. What's so special about this year? Well, 2015 is the 100th anniversary of Einstein's publication of the theory of general relativity. So he published the theory of relativity in two parts, special relativity and general relativity. Special relativity came first. It was published in 1905. 
And the 100th anniversary of that, 2005, the United Nations declared the International Year of Physics. And he published General Relativity in 1915. And so for this 100th anniversary, the United Nations has declared this the International Year of Light. And uh, last fall, they, the folks from the International Year of Light put out a, basically a call to scientists around the world and said, what can you do to talk, you know, teach the public more about relativity during this special year? And I thought, well, I guess I could go talk to people. So I decided to do that. And you've been doing that all over the country? And I've been doing that all over the place this year. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention, because even Jeff only just got this, this is the next book, right? Comes out in January? That is my new children's book, yep. That was the airshipped one copy that arrived yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it doesn't officially publish until January. Probably be out in stores, hopefully, by October, November. This is very cool, uh, I Human, but it's really a wonderful exploration of stuff that's happening at the edge of science, which uh, I would think kids of all ages uh, would be very excited about. Uh, that's not the end of uh, what we're doing uh, today because we have yet another author that I'm going to bring up on the stage now. You may have caught my next guest during one of his appearances on the Colbert Report. Uh, or maybe you were lucky enough to see him on stage last March when one of my favorite podcasts, Science or Otherwise, The Infinite Monkey Cage. Do we have any other Infinite Monkey Cage fans here? Oh, man, only one. <laughs> you and me. That is, it is such a funny show. Well, they came to L.A. I cannot believe that I missed out on this because it is absolutely marvelous. Uh, you've probably seen a movie or a TV show that benefited from his science advice, or you might read his popular blog, Preposterous Universe. Or perhaps you enjoyed his most recent work as co-author of a scientific paper. Now, listen, because you may find this very useful. It's called How to Recover a Qubit That Has Fallen Into a Black Hole. Or we demonstrate an algorithm for the retrieval of a qubit encoded in spin angular momentum that has been dropped into a no-firewall unitary black hole. Retrieval is achieved analogously to quantum teleportation by collecting Hawking radiation and performing measurements on the black hole. I know you're waiting for the movie, right? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sean Carroll, Caltech professor of physics. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Thanks. for coming. Uh, so listen, does, uh, congratulations on the recovery of the qubits, by the way. Does Thank this, you. Are we getting closer now to solving the lost sock challenge? That's harder. You know, the real world is always harder than our thought experiments. I want to tell you how very much I enjoyed reading your latest book. Uh, this is it, The Particle at the End of the Universe, uh, about the discovery of the Higgs boson. But really, much more than that, just a sneaky way of introducing the general public to what is known as the standard model. You noticed that, yes. You figured that out. <laughs> Caught me. Yeah. It's quite a, quite a wonderful tracing of that zoo of particles that makes up our understanding of all of what is uh, the, uh, the particles that make up all of us sitting here today. Uh, it's, it's very fun. It's really a good read. Uh, and I enjoyed it so much that I'm now reading his earlier book, From Eternity to Here, The Quest for the Ultimate Theory of Time, which I really should have read first for this discussion because we're not going to talk much about particle physics, but we are going to talk about relativity, which is very much present in, uh, in that book. So though I have sworn it's not what we're about today, we may need to spend a few minutes talking about what relativity is. Do either of you find it surprising, you know, 110 years after Einstein began to reveal it to us, that relativity still confounds and confuses and, and even frightens so many people? Sean? You know, Isaac Newton came up with uh, classical mechanics in the 1600s, and that still frightens and confuses people <laughs> who uh, have to take... So I'm not at all surprised that relativity uh, has the same impact, but it's a little bit different because relativity is something that you don't notice in your day-to-day -day existence. Like when you walk down the street or even if you drive pretty fast, you're not approaching the speed of light. You know, there's no black holes around sucking you in. Uh, the universe is very old compared to you or me. So 
It's a realm of experience that is far from the everyday, and therefore it should be the least surprising thing in the world that it's very counterintuitive, that it's a different way of looking at the world. So in some sense, we should not be surprised that relativity is so surprising. Jeff, you've got a great quote right in line with that uh, in your book about common sense. Well, a lot of people will, will tell me that one of the things they, that bothers them about relativity is that it violates common sense. And I like to point out to, to you all that uh, it does not violate common sense at all because when it comes to these ideas of relativity, you don't have any common sense. And the reason for that is exactly what Sean just explained. Common sense, by definition, is sense that you've developed through your common experiences. And you've never experienced the conditions under which the effects of relativity become obvious. You've never traveled close to the speed of light. You've never been in an extremely strong gravitational field. So there's no reason why it should make sense to you based on your common experience. The problem people have with relativity is they think that their low speed common sense should translate to high speeds, but there's, there's no reason that that should be the case. And if I can give you just a brief analogy, uh, we'll do audience participation. Can everybody point up and everybody point down? Okay, and that's really good common sense. You can use that to know why you shouldn't jump off a building or to play basketball and so on. But you probably remember somewhere back in first and second grade that this common sense created a crisis for you when the teacher showed you a globe. And you looked at it and you said, oh my gosh, those poor people in Australia are in big trouble. Why? Because you expected this common sense to apply to the whole world. But it doesn't. For the whole world, you need a different common sense, one in which up is away from the center of the earth and down is toward it. You made that adjustment. By now, it seems natural. Relativity is the same kind of idea. You need a different common sense for high speeds, for very strong gravity. But it's doable. But for some reason, we don't teach kids or grown-ups how to do it unless they happen to be physics majors. No flat earth society members here tonight, I hope. <laughs> um, I, I was guilty of this. And you still hear people saying it all the time. People who say, oh yeah, yeah, relativity, of course. Einstein was telling us, everything is relative. Mm, not so much. No, it's a silly name. Most names are silly. Quantum mechanics is a silly name. Uh, we're not very good at naming things and we get stuck with them sometimes. So there's a bit of actual concept of relativity in the theory of relativity. You know, it came about the special theory came first and the general theory came second. And when I was in sixth grade first coming across these ideas, I always thought like, but the special relativity, that sounds special. That should be better. Why are they keep like, saying that general relativity is better or further along? And of course, it's a different sense of the word. It means more general. It includes the theory of gravity. That's the difference between general relativity and special relativity. Special relativity is a special case of relativity. And Einstein called it the invariance theory. He didn't call it relativity when, when he invented it. But basically, the reason why it got stuck with that name is because Einstein kept pointing out that when we talk about the speed of something, it's always relative to something else. There's no such thing as an absolute speed of anything in the universe. Now, sneakily, that's true long before relativity comes along. Galileo invented the principle of relativity. You can't tell how fast you're moving in Newtonian mechanics. If Newton had been right about space and time, there's still no such thing as an absolute velocity. The difference is that Einstein said, but the speed of light is special. He says two things. Number one, you can't tell how fast you're moving because there's no absolute frame of reference. But number two, the speed of light is always the speed of light. No matter how fast you think you're going, when the light beam goes by you, you measure it to be going at the same speed. And combining those two things, that's a real mind twister. This is all stuff you go into in great detail, of course, in your book uh, as well, Jeff. And you also talk about when Einstein developed special, the special theory, there were other people kind of edging closer to it as well. Maybe it was just a matter of time if he hadn't come up with it. Well, when Einstein published the special theory of relativity, his paper is actually called On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies because he was dealing with some well-known problems in the theory of electricity and magnetism that a lot of physicists had been looking at. And I think a lot of historians of science say that if Einstein had not published special relativity when he did, other people were close enough that it might have been as little as months mm. away from someone else uh, getting to it. And this, this came out of 
nobody quite made the leap that Einstein did, but they were already dealing with C, right? The, M, the C in E equals MC squared. Basically, they had all of the equations. That's why it's called, you know, Lorentz contraction, because Mr. Lorentz was there talking about it. Uh, what they didn't have is the conceptual insight that Einstein came along with. So they were trying to reconcile these ideas that you can only measure your velocity relative to something, but the speed of light is always the same. How do you fit those together? And so they invented the equations that would make it work, but it was all with respect to this thing called the ether. There was something filling the universe, and you could measure your speed with respect to it. That's why the speed of light was special, because it's with respect to the ether, they thought. And it was Einstein who just looked at these equations and said, you know what, guys? There's no role played by the ether. I can just say, no, there isn't any ether. The equations are still true. It all works. And they were like, oh, yeah, okay, that's right. We should have thought of that. And I don't want to go too far afield, but didn't the great... Michelson-Morley experiment take place right up in the hills above us here? No. No, oh, shoot, where was it? <laughs> this was I'm the one that looked for the Pretty sure that was in Cleveland. Ether. I think that was at Case Western, right? Isn't it? I, I don't know, actually. Yeah. I thought it was done up in our hills here. Maybe that was to help determine the speed of light. Oh, well. We've done some good things. We discovered the expansion of the universe right up here in these yeah, hills. So yeah, we discovered yeah, antimatter like down the block <laughs> at Caltech. Right. So don't worry. Go up yeah. the hill to the 100-inch yeah. Wilson, folks, and you can see the chair, you know. They, they, when the fire was taking place up there, they said, oh, yeah, we're going to take the chair with us if this place burns. But the Michelson-Morley experiment, since you brought that up, is, is just a great example to me of, of Einstein and what made his thinking so special. The Michelson-Morley experiment was done in 1887, almost 20 years before Einstein published mm. the special theory of relativity. And when you look at it with hindsight, what the Michelson-Morley experiment demonstrated very clearly is that the speed of light is the same for everyone, no matter how you're moving all reference frames. But they were so attached to this idea of the ether and the fact that if you had a constant speed of light, it made things really weird, that basically everybody else tried to kludge their way around it, find the crazy mathematical tricks to work around it. And Einstein said, maybe nature's not trying to fool us. Maybe it's the result is what it is. Um, we got to go back to that formula that I mentioned. Years ago, I was doing... Uh, man on the street, person on the street, radio stuff. And I decided one day, I'm going to ask people for their favorite scientific formula. Well, the fact is, most people can't come up with anything except E equals MC squared. What does it mean? Many people in this audience, sophisticated, smart group, look at them. Um, they may know already. But what are we really, what was Einstein telling us there? Yeah, you notice it's not even typeset correctly on your uh, poster. <laughs> Did they get the, oh, e look at that, they didn't do the uh, superscript. <laughs> okay. It, that should be a superscript because it's the speed of light times the speed of light, the speed yeah. of light squared. And, you know, it wasn't in Einstein's original paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. It was a little follow-up he wrote shortly thereafter. He goes, oh, and by the way, mass is a form of energy. You know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Just, I hadn't mentioned that before. It was like graffiti. He just scribbled it on a it wall. It was a wonderful somewhere. example of this impulse that physicists always have to unify things. They like an explanation if one simple explanation covers many, many different phenomena. Yeah. And when Einstein, in the theory of special relativity, essentially said that space and time are two different aspects of one unified underlying thing called space-time. That came along with a whole bunch of consequences, like energy and mass are two aspects of one underlying thing. And the way to interpret that equation, people, people get it wrong. Like they say, oh, energy is mass times the speed of light squared. So what this is telling me is that what energy is, is mass, and then I multiply it by the speed of light. That's, don't think of it that way. It's not how Einstein wrote it. He wrote the equivalent of m equals e over c squared. He divided both sides by c squared. Now, who cares? What he's saying, what the equation means, is that there's many different forms of energy. There's energy of motion, there's energy in the gravitational field, there's energy uh, of heat and so forth. What Einstein is saying is that what mass is, is another form of energy. Mass is just the energy an object has when it's not moving. That's what mass is. It's, it's the mass times the speed of light squared. So that's a kind of energy. You can convert that energy into other kinds of energy. Atomic energy, nuclear power is one such example. And that half bottle of water there, okay, two-thirds <laughs> bottle of water there, the energy represented by that water in that bottle, pretty darn huge, right, Jeff? It's very huge because the speed of light is a big number. It's <laughs> I want to drink some water so there'll be less energy yeah. in the bottle. So. Energy water, yeah. <laughs> the speed of light is uh, 
300,000 kilometers per second, you square a very big number and you get a, a really, really big number. So it's telling you that the amount of energy um, contained in that mass is going to be an enormous amount. So, yeah. you know, this could probably, you know, if you converted it completely to energy power the United States, I don't know, for certainly a few hours, maybe longer, right? <clears throat> go through the calculation. If you did 100% yeah. of it. Yep. If you get 100% of it. And incidentally, um, nuclear power converts much less than 1% of the energy, of the mass, into energy. So if you want to get it fully converted, you need a Star Trek matter, anti-matter. Yeah. Annihilation. Yeah. Just watch out for those core breaches. Um, speaking of core breaches, if you had to say more in 45 seconds about the core principles of, we're still talking about the special theory, what would you, what would you both say? Who first? There's one thing called space time. Uh, there's a, an absolute speed limit, the speed of light that relates the amount of space to the amount of time. And so the amount of time you experience traveling through the universe depends on how you move through it, just like the distance you walk depends on your path when you walk. And, and I would add to that that the space-time idea is very important because you mentioned before the question of did Einstein say everything is relative? He did not. And in fact, he, people get into this idea of time and space being relative depending on your motion, which is very important, but one of my favorite quotes is from a Taylor and Wheeler, fa famous uh, relativity textbook. Time is different for different observers. Space is different for different mm -hmm. observers. But space-time is the same for everyone. So Einstein's actually telling us that there is this thing that is absolute that everyone can agree on called space-time. And by the way, we're not being historically accurate here. Einstein didn't even like the idea of space-time. When he laid down the principles of special relativity, there was a follow-up by Hermann Minkowski, Minkowski, he would have said, a German physicist, German mathematician, who said, you know what, as mathematicians tend to do, like, you can make this really cool and mathematical if you think of it all as one big four-dimensional space-time. And Einstein's like, you mathematicians, like, you're wasting <laughs> our time. You're with your formalism and your blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, that segues right into general relativity, where he realizes, oh, no, I, I need to think about space-time, and that's where it all comes and from. So he went away for 10 years and came back in 1915 and changed the universe. Let's talk about that. So far, just special theory. We're going to go on to the general theory of relativity, and I'm going to start with a prop. There it is. Okay, watch. Is that Newton's apple? Uh, I, not, <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to take a bite of it and see. Here we go. All right, so Sean, you study this. What the hell just happened there? That poor apple tried its best to move on a straight line in the curved space-time geometry <laughs> caused by the energy momentum of the Earth. And then it did so for a little while, but then the stage intervened. <laughs> so Perfect. a good deal of energy there. But this was something that, you know, none other than Newton himself had a big problem with. Uh, he told us what to expect when an apple meets the Earth rushing up to it. But he didn't like being puzzled by the mechanism. In fact, we got a quote. Uh, Jeff, this is right out of your relativity tour uh, slideshow. So there it is. When Jeff shows this and he does his presentations, he doesn't tell people it's Isaac Newton. And a lot of people, you told me, assume it's from Einstein at Pe first. People, so let's read the quote. That one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum, and force may be conveyed from one to another, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has a competent faculty in thinking can ever fall into it. So what, what are we talking about here? He's talking about gravity. So you have, let's say, the sun and the Earth. And gravity causes the Earth to orbit the Sun. But they're 150 million kilometers apart. Neither the Earth nor the Sun have any eyes, ears, noses, senses, talk. How do they even know each other are there to feel this force? So it's being conveyed at a distance through a vacuum from one to the other. That's what Newton is saying here. But how? It makes no sense. And so, yes, I usually put this up without telling people it's Newton first. And the assumption is, oh, yeah, Einstein's saying this theory is crazy. But no, it's, it's Newton saying his own theory is crazy. And yet it works. It works beautifully. Sean, they pay you at that place up the street to sit and think about this stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs>
pittance, yes, but sure. <laughs> um, this works, right? I mean, the general theory, like the special theory, it does describe for us how the universe conducts its business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a singular example, really, in the history of physics, the general theory of relativity. Because if you think about special relativity, as we said, many people were pushing forward these ideas, thinking about them. If you think about quantum mechanics, the standard model of particle physics, dozens or thousands of people working hard, contributing little pieces and so forth. The general theory of relativity was basically Einstein. It was Einstein and, you know, he chatted with some of his friends. And he was, he was faced with special relativity, which everyone uh, accepted pretty quickly after it came along in 1905. And then most people, you know, most physicists of the day, they were interested in either thermodynamics or the, the new field of radioactivity, right? I mean, this was the exciting new thing, what, what eventually grew up into particle physics. But Einstein knew that, you know, there was this other force lying around, gravity. You know, Newton had figured it out, we all thought. But Einstein knew just from the equations that Newton's version of gravity didn't fit into special relativity. So he said, all right, I'm just going to put them together. That'll take, you know, a couple months, and then I'll work on radioactivity <laughs> like everybody else. And it took him 10 years because uh, it, they just don't fit together. And what he ended up doing was not just like a new theory of physics, but a new kind of theory. That's, that's what makes him Einstein. That's what gets him on the t cover of Time magazine uh, for the person of the century. You know, before general relativity, a theory of physics had two things. It was like a play. There was a stage and there were actors. And the stage was space and time, and the actors were the particles and forces and fields that moved in that space time. And Einstein says, in general relativity, the stage is an actor. The stage moves around. The stage has lines. It has motivation. You know, you know it's, it's interacting with the other things. Space time itself is dynamical. It can move and change. It has a life of its own. It's not just a static thing. And this changes not just some equations. This changes what space-time is to us. It opens up the possibility, for example, that the universe can have a beginning in the discovery of the Big Bang, which, again, Einstein was a little bit reluctant to buy into, but now we think is there. We don't know whether the Big Bang is the beginning of the universe or not, but it, it might very well be. But pre-Einstein, more than 100 years ago, no one thought that was a question. The universe was eternal. It lasted forever. Isaac Newton thought that. Uh, special relativity predicted that. There was no beginning to time. There's no end to time. But now we can talk about those ideas because of general relativity. This takes us right back to good old Edwin Hubble up the, up the mountain there, who was, saw, yeah, hey, boy, the universe really is uh, expanding. Uh, and uh, there's much more to the story than that. And maybe we'll touch on a little bit of that uh, later. You do spend a good deal of your time, though, talking, thinking about general relativity and talking to other scientists about this, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's central to modern physics, yeah. yeah. Um, you both spend a lot of time uh, sort of being science versions of Johnny Appleseed, uh, doing events like this, blogging, writing books. Um, when you talk to groups like this, again, not a smart group like this, but people who maybe this is new to. What causes the greatest astonishment, the greatest sort of sense of awe or maybe disbelief when you talk to them about the consequences, about what relativity tells us about how the universe works? Jeff, you want to start? Well, you know, there's a lot. Almost everything in relativity is kind of mind-blowing when you first mm -hmm. grasp onto it. I think the thing that people find most surprising is that it's understandable. Hmm. that once you get the hang of it, all these things that maybe you didn't think about too hard before, but if you thought about them hard, you go, oh, wait a minute, just like that quote from Newton. You know, for, for Newton wrote that, and then for the next couple hundred years, physicists went about their business and didn't worry too much about the fact that the whole theory was absurd if you really thought about it too hard, because it, it worked, it worked so well, so don't worry about it, let's we'll keep going. But once you get relativity, all of a sudden these things that when you thought about them really hard, were, didn't make any sense, they all make sense once you have relativity. So it's the idea that relativity actually makes the universe simpler, not more complex, that I think people find 
most surprising. That's not to say that you can get it instantly. It's going to take some time to think about this. Mm. But once you do, all these questions you've probably asked in the past will start to make sense. Sean? There's, there are many. I mean, the existence of the Big Bang is, is one. Um, but, but let me pick the existence of dark matter and dark energy. These are ideas that uh, many people, they'll hear the cosmologists talking about it. You know, the cosmologists can talk all they want about the expansion of the universe and galaxies and quasars, and everyone will follow along. And then you say, oh, and things like the atoms that we're made of, all the particles that we've detected here on Earth, that's only 5% of the universe. And they're like, oh, come on. You know, you, you can't be serious. 95% of the universe is dark stuff that we don't see, either dark matter, some particles that we haven't detected yet in any experiment, but they're most of the particles in the universe, or dark energy, which isn't even a particle, sort of spreads out uh, uniformly through space. And the 1990s will go down in human history as the decade in which we figured out the inventory of stuff in the universe. And how can we do that? How do you know if it's dark? If you don't see it, how do you know it's there? And the answer is general relativity, because it, it goes back to E equals mc squared. E equals mc squared means that what mass is, is the amount of energy that anything has. But remember, mass does two different things. One thing that mass does is say, like, how hard is it to accelerate something, right? Like, how much inertia is there in it? The other thing is it causes gravity, right? The bigger the mass is, the more gravity you have. And Einstein was a unifier. He brought everything together. Mass is just one version of energy. So in Einstein's theory of gravity, all forms of energy cause gravity. Hmm. And everything has energy. There's nothing that exists in the universe that doesn't come along with energy. So you don't need to see something to know it's there because it can give rise to a gravitational field. So through the gravitational effects is how we detect the existence of dark matter and dark energy 95% of the universe. So you and I are like the flashing lights on the Christmas tree that you see at a dark night. Like, you see the flashing lights, but it's not most of the stuff. Like, most of the universe is the Christmas tree that you don't see. That's the dark matter and the dark energy. And without Einstein, we wouldn't know it. Am I right that uh, the current thinking among cosmologists is that if it weren't for dark matter, we might not have galaxies? You know, cosmologists say a lot of crazy things. So uh, <laughs> that's a very hard question to answer. You know, you talk about a hypothetical universe that is in our universe. In our universe, I think that the, a safer thing to say is the existence of dark matter was of great help in creating galaxies. If there weren't dark matter, well, I don't know. What else is different? Are the other forces of nature the same? Is the initial amount of density fluctuations? You know, I can imagine lots of different things. So I don't, I don't necessarily think we know about all the possibilities mm. to say something like that. But, th but there is no question that in the formation of the universe as we know it, if you see these beautiful pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope of galaxies spread across the dark night sky, dar every one of those galaxies is surrounded by a puffy halo of dark matter. Mm. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I didn't know if you wanted to get in on that or not. But I... Well, I mean, that's correct. It, under, in our universe, there's not enough gravity in just the visible, the ordinary matter to have pulled stuff together to make galaxies. So in our universe, we need that dark matter and the gravity of the dark matter to pull stuff together to make Although galaxies. Although you're not willing to go quite that far, Sean. But you said in our universe, yeah, yeah, you know, oh, but okay. in another universe, things could be different. You know, it's very possible that in our universe, dark matter was even crucial in making the first stars. There's a mm -hmm. whole subject of study called dark stars. And we don't know. This is all speculative stuff. But the universe, this is Einstein's lesson as far as gravity is concerned. Gravity is universal. He really took Newton's idea of the apple falling, the same explanation for the apple falling and, and the planets moving around the stars, uh, the moving around the sun, and he made that absolutely extend to the entire universe and everything in it. Gravity is absolutely universal, so everything in the universe interacts with everything else through the force of gravity. And, and people often will ask, how do you know that the laws of physics that we discover here on Earth apply in the rest of the universe? And this is the answer to that question also. You can look out there with your telescope and you see things happening. And you can take spectra here on Earth and you can take spectra of things in the distant universe and you see the same kind of sets of spectral lines, you see the same types of gravitational motion. That's how we know that the same laws of nature are operating. 
Now, we could spend the whole night talking about dark matter and dark energy, and maybe we should sometime. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. Another night, another night. But, uh, but we still we really, won't know what they are. Well, aren't we closing in on dark matter? I got that idea from your book, Sean. We would really like to think so. Yeah. So, but dark, I mean, let me be honest. It's very possible that sometime in the next two years, there'll be a front-page headline in the New York Times, scientists have discovered dark matter. It's very possible for the next 50 years there will be no such headline. So we just don't know <laughs> enough about what it is. And dark energy? We're a lot farther, aren't we? Uh, well, I think that's, um, that's a, there's a judgment call there. We have a perfectly good leading candidate for what the dark energy is. It was, it was invented by a guy named um, Einstein. That's it, yes. <laughs> Albert Einstein in 1917 uh, invented what he called the cosmological constant, the cosmological term, what we now call the vacuum energy, the energy of empty space itself. You take one little cubic centimeter of space and you empty it out. So there's no matter, there's no radiation, there's no dark matter, and you ask how much energy is there in a cubic centimeter of empty space? And you might think there's zero because there's nothing there, but Einstein says there can be energy inherent in space itself. And we think there is. We think that there is one hundred millionth of an erg of energy in every centimeter, every cubic centimeter, everywhere in the universe. And this energy is pushing the universe apart and will continue to do so forever. So that matches up. That figure, that, that number that Einstein came up with matches up pretty well with what we see. Of he didn't come up with that number. Is. We measured that number ah, okay. in 1998. Okay. The Nobel Prize was handed out in 2011. And didn't Einstein feel later that he'd made a tremendous mistake coming up with the what he called the cosmological constant. Einstein's mistakes are our brilliant discoveries. That's just how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> it's too bad he didn't uh, learn to live long enough to learn that, uh, boy, he was right again. Um, all right, like I said, we could go on and on with this, but let's bring it back directly to relativity. We've talked around uh, some of the things that we've seen in the universe that, that tell us, yes, this is the way the universe works. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Where else can we look? And especially in our daily lives, where can we see relativity at work? Uh, Jeff, this is something you and I talked about a little bit. Well, it's, it's at work everywhere in your life. So remember, Einstein's paper on special relativity was on the electrodynamics of moving body. It's bodies. He's looking at the theory of electricity and magnetism. So in a sense, Maxwell's Equations of Electricity and Magnetism, published 40 years before Einstein published Special Relativity, already has relativity embedded in it mathematically. People just didn't quite realize it yet. And so in that sense, relativity is a theory tied in with electricity and magnetism. So the lights here and the picture on the screen. These things that these have things, magnets in them. All, all these things work only because relativity is correct. Mm -hmm. um, e equals mc squared, we know that's what makes the sun shine. That's what makes nuclear power. So when you're outside and you feel the sun shining on your skin, you're collecting more evidence that relativity is correct. Um, and it's built into all our modern devices. Uh, GPS satellites have to do corrections for the fact that time runs differently where those GPS satellites are for two reasons. One, because they're moving relative to us, so you get a correction from special relativity, and two, because they're at a different strength of gravity at higher altitude than we are down at the ground, so you get a correction for general relativity. Those corrections are very, very tiny, and don't worry, you don't have to calculate them for yourself. The, your devices do those calculations, but if they didn't, if they didn't correct for those very tiny variations in time, we're talking about nanoseconds here, um, accumulated over a day. If they didn't make those corrections, you would literally be lost when you used your GPS device. Sean, where else do you tell people to look for relativity? I think, you know, there's a fun example. I, I think that, uh, you know, Jeffrey's exactly right, that everything in your everyday life is either electromagnetism or gravity, and they're both ruled by relativity. So there you are. Everything you see is relativity. Um, but there are quirky, fun examples. Like, uh, again, down the street at Caltech, you know, uh, where I work, there's a guy, Carl Anderson, who in the 1930s found three new particles, uh, which is pretty good because there were only three particles known at the time. You know, he has discovered half the particles uh, <laughs> for a little while there. And one of them was the muon. The muon like, came out of literally a uh, famous physicist, I.I. I. Robbie, when the muon was discovered, said, who ordered that? <laughs> like it, didn't, it didn't fit in. It decayed away very quickly. You know, a muon, if you find it here in a millionth of a second, it's gone. 
And he found it, it from cosmic rays. He didn't make muons. They didn't have particle accelerators. He had a big detector, and he just like opened up to the sky. And down rained these muons, and you could see them in his detector. And the funny thing is, if you go back and say, OK, but muons are unstable. They, they decay away very quickly. So you imagine that some energetic particle hits the Earth's atmosphere high up there. It makes a muon. It splashes, makes a muon, and the muon travels down. So you know how fast it's moving down, and you know how long it lives. And you like do your calculation, like, it shouldn't have made it down here to Earth. It should have decayed away. But then you go, oh, wait, I forgot. Relativity. Mm. The muon is moving very close to the speed of light. So to the muon, it didn't take any time at all to get from the upper atmosphere down to here. To us, it took a, a long time. To the muon, it didn't take, it took less than its lifetime. So the only reason why muons can reach the ground from cosmic rays is because they appear to us to live longer than they should because of relativistic time dilation. You say, how does that affect your everyday life? Well, I mean, it affected Carl Anderson's everyday life because he found it, but it's possible, and now I'm going to speak outside school because I'm a physicist, not a biologist, but it is possible that those muons in the cosmic rays play a role in the mutation rate of the DNA that we have as we reproduce future generations. And part of Darwinian evolution was sped up just a little <coughs> bit by special relativity. Hmm. Don't we see something very similar happening with that spray of particles coming out of uh, the Large Hadron Collider when it knocks uh, protons together? I think well, both of you talk. It's much more dramatic than that because you know we, we discovered the Higgs boson right in, in 2012. You can buy my book right now. <laughs> there it is. You can just right go to there. Amazon. You don't need to wait. Um, <laughs> the Higgs boson weighs over 100 times more than a proton. So there are no Higgs bosons hidden inside a proton. You know, we, we're smashing two protons together. And people often use the, the analogy, like particle physics is like smashing two watches together and seeing the pieces come out and trying to figure out how watches work by doing that. This is a bad analogy because the things that come out are not things that were there to begin with. The reason you were able to make that Higgs boson, even though it has a much higher mass than the proton, is because E equals mc squared. And when you smash those protons together, the energy of the proton is much bigger than its mass because it's moving near the speed of light. So it has a rest mass, but it has a huge amount of what we call kinetic energy. So there's a huge amount of energy only because of special relativity, and that lets us create the mass that is in the Higgs boson. So I prefer the analogy. It's, it's like studying uh, you throw two Timexes together and you wait for a Rolex to pop out. <laughs> You're creating something that wasn't there in the first place. And a lot of people don't realize when a lot of people have heard e equals mc squared and they think about nuclear power, you know, nuclear bombs, the m being converted into the e, but particle accelerators are basically doing the reverse of that. They're taking the e and converting it into the mass. And man, I wish we had time to talk more about the Higgs field as opposed to the particles since we're living inside it right now. We are. It's letting me sit here as we, <laughs> as we talk. But let me, let me add one, one quick thing there about the particle accelerators that a lot of people don't often think about is one of the most famous and least liked consequences of special relativity is that you cannot reach or exceed that the damn speed, speed limit of light. Right, bothers people because we don't like being told what we can and cannot do. So everybody's always looking for a way around it. We could talk about that. But experimentally, uh, Sean could probably get me the correct numbers, but I'll just have to make some up because I don't remember the exact numbers. But you go back to when particle accelerators were first invented many decades ago. You put a certain amount of energy in there, and you get these particles going at 99.9% .9 the speed of light. Today's particle accelerators are thousands of times, maybe more than that, more powerful putting thousands of times more energy, and what do you get in speed? A couple more nines on the yeah. decimal place. Why don't you get double the speed when you put in double the energy? Why don't you get a thousand times the speed? Because you can't reach the speed of light, and that's direct experimental proof that you can't do it, because no matter how hard you try, you just get a little closer. Could have worn my, my uh, T-shirt with Einstein looking like a CHP officer, and it says, you know, <laughs> 186,000 miles per second. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> I think Einstein would use kilometers, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Was he and Lincoln three, Chafee. 300, no, I won't get into it. Sean, where do we look for, where can we see general 
relativity. Mostly we, we've been talking about where we can see special relativity so far. Well, if it depends. Do you want to know in your everyday life where you can see general relativity? Sure. Right, so you can't is the short <laughs> answer. So the GPS is the one example yeah. that everyone knows, and, that, and that's because it's the one example. That's really it. And, you know, part, what I want to say, I'm too polite to say it out loud, but what I would like to say is we shouldn't be asking that question. I mean, we're faced here with one of the titanic, towering accomplishments of human intellectual history, and we're saying, but what about my needs? <laughs> it's like you know, going to vacation in Paris and, and eating at McDonald's. The general theory of relativity has enormous consequences for the fundamental nature of reality. It says that space and time are players in the game that the universe can have a beginning and maybe an end, that it can expand forever, that energy is not conserved, that there are black holes, that uh, there's nothing we can do that doesn't affect the geometry of the universe in some way. And it is not about a better iPhone. It's about a better understanding of the universe of which we're a part. And we're going to come back to that toward the end of this conversation and why basic research is worthwhile for its own sake. Uh, but I mean, you mentioned one piece of evidence, and that is the good evidence we see for the Big Bang. There is one other, which we have some images of, actually, and it's gravitational lensing. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it depends a little bit on how you define uh, your everyday life. Uh, <laughs> these kinds of images... You're a professional astronomer. Your everyday life is a very different one. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that too. But I think even for the, for the public, people have seen these Hubble Space Telescope images, they are somewhat embedded now in our everyday lives. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they don't, um, they're not a technology that you're using, they're not changing things, but everybody goes about their life with some sort of, of worldview. And if, if you ran into somebody who said, you know, I believe Earth is the center of the universe and the sun and everything else goes around us. Well, 400 years ago, that would have been a perfectly reasonable thing to base your worldview on. You'd get on. in pretty big trouble if you didn't say that. Right, but, but today, if you ran into somebody who said that, you'd, you'd feel kind of sorry for them because mm -hmm. their worldview is based on something that's demonstrably false today. And yet, we go around, most people go around their everyday lives with this idea that space and time are these absolutes, that gravity is just this magical force that acts at a distance. And we've built these worldviews based on that. And for 100 years now, we've known that there's more to it mm. than that. That, that. That's, you know, in a sense, that's just as inaccurate as believing that Earth is the center of the universe. And we have these pictures that you can see anytime you want. Go to hubblesite.com or org, whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, you can see all these examples where general relativity is showing up very, very clearly. All right, Sean, before we go out, leave here and do that and go to the website, give us a preview. What What's going on in this image that we see here? And you've got in front of you there. <clears throat> so remember, gravity is universal. That's general relativity. Everything is affected by gravity, which means that even the passage of light through the universe is affected by gravity. If you, if you wanted to ask the question, you know, so what about Newton? What if Newton had been right? Would light be deflected by gravity if Newton had been right? And the answer is, like, is zero divided by zero. There's no good answer because everything is deflected, but light has zero mass, so you don't know what is it, it's doing. Einstein resolves all that ambiguity. And so this is an example of a galaxy uh, with dark matter around it. And it, it's just very, very nicely arranged so that there's another galaxy behind it that is very bright. And that galaxy behind it gets its light bent, traveling through space. It's like looking through a warped piece of glass. So you see multiple images, just like you would through sort of a warped lens, and therefore we cleverly call this gravitational lensing. And it's one of the many, many good pieces of evidence. We have overwhelming evidence for the correctness of general relativity. And just to clarify that, what you're seeing in this picture, the four dots are one thing behind the central dot and you're seeing it four times because of the light being bent on four different paths It's a us. It's a cosmic, uh, f f oh, I'm trying to think of the term now, it's uh, one of those mirrors that you see at uh, carnivals. Fun it's house a cosmic, mirror, yeah. Yeah, a cosmic carnival yeah. mirror. We got another one here, in fact we have several more. Um, here's another one, it's a little bit harder to tell here, but you can kind of see 
there's sort of a, a circular distortion there, seeing the same thing, right? Basically. Well, yeah, you're seeing things that are both in the foreground and in the background. So in the foreground, you see galaxies that look perfectly normal. But if they're in the background, their light is being warped as if it passed through a crystal ball, which is the gravitational field of that cluster of galaxies there. And what you're seeing here, by the way, this is, a, as you might have guessed, a Hubble Space Telescope image. And what you're seeing there, every one of those is a galaxy more or less like ours, like the Milky Way. Uh, look for the Hubble deep field images when you go to that website that Jeff mentioned, and you'll see some of this. The next one here, if it works, this is fascinating. This is not real. It's a simulation, uh, and so it's basically computer graphics. But take a look at what happens here. Now, as I read it, that is a galaxy, within the computer anyway, but representing what would really happen, a galaxy passing behind a black hole. Comments, guys? I mean, that's kind of self-explanatory, isn't it? Computers are awesome, is my comment. I mean, we can never observe something like this, but that is what it would look like, yeah. Uh, look at that. Uh, it's just incredible to watch. Now, you know, I imagine if this were happening in the actual universe, we'd be looking at, what, how many millions of years here? <laughs> or at least tens of thousands. The galaxy wouldn't be moving from our point of view, but you could have a black hole near to us mm. that was moving rapidly, and we would definitely see, in fact, we do see um, what is called gravitational microlensing. We see like one little tiny object passing in front of a star, and you might think, well, it blocks the light, but it, it's actually not going by it. It gravitationally lenses the light, and it gets brighter for a little bit, exactly as this galaxy sort of gets brighter right there. It's a great point. Yeah, I could stare at this for, for at least an hour or so. So uh, if I can just give a, give a little more yeah. brief explanation there. So you know, imagine that I'm a, a distant galaxy, and here's another galaxy that's a little closer to you. So my light, if this wasn't here, you'd just see my light coming straight at you. But because it's here, this will bend my light. So if you were, say, in this set center section, I've got some light that's going off in that direction that shouldn't be hitting you. But because it's being bent by this galaxy, it may end up hitting you. So you think you see something over here, even though that's not where I am. Mm. Now, if you extend that in the three dimensions here, you could see, in principle, me as an entire ring around this microphone here. Depending on exactly where you are and how you're looking, you might see two images, four images, like that earlier photo you showed, light stretched out into arcs, or even sometimes the entire ring, like you see in this simulation. And because it depends on the exact, you know, how am I directly behind it and so on, you can actually use general relativity in reverse to say where is the, gra the mass located mm. to cause what we see. And so astronomers use that to map the distribution of dark matter in the universe. So these are, this is not just you know, this interesting, cool theoretical idea. It's practical in that sense for astronomy, at least. This is how we know the dark matter is there, how much there is, and how it's distributed through space. Don't astronomers also use gravitational lensing to see objects, which otherwise might be way too far away? I mean, it's almost like a little amplifier. If you get really lucky, if everything lines up just right, you see it brighter. And so that's a, yeah, it's a wonderful way to extend our reach a little bit into the cosmos. We got one more of these just for fun, and this is a real image. There it is, the Smiley Galaxy. <laughs> also from the Hubble Space Telescope, pretty cool. You know, while we're talking about this kind of stuff and uh, CGI, computer generated imagery, Sean, your Caltech colleague, Kip Thorne, Yes. Another famous physicist from that place up the road. He was deeply involved in the movie Interstellar. Uh, and in fact, I've talked to him on this stage about that a few years before the movie came out. We talked about what they were hoping to accomplish. And he's been on uh, Planetary Radio, the, the Planetary Society's weekly radio and podcast series that you heard about. Because when the movie came out, he came out with his book, The Science of Interstellar, which I also recommend very highly. Um, We've got an image, which is CGI, and it's of a black hole. And there it is. But that's right out of the movie. Uh, when you look at that, somebody who deals with this stuff on a more or less daily basis, Sean, I mean, what do you think of this, this image that came out of a movie? Uh, it is almost exactly correct. Almost. Yes, they actually f intentionally fudged one thing. So this is, 
you're, you're, what you're seeing is actually just, there's a black hole, you don't see the black hole, it's black, but around the black hole, there's a thin disk of matter, the accretion disk, that is slowly falling into the black hole, and that is very, very hot and radiating to beat the band. So what you're seeing, what looks like the sort of circle with the disk around it, is just the, the one disk, but it's gravitationally lensed up and down. So you're seeing what looks like the circle around it is behind the black hole. You're seeing it gravitationally lensed, but also the whole thing is spinning like crazy. And because of the Doppler effect, what that means is like in one direction it's coming toward you and gets blue shifted to higher frequencies. In the other direction it's moving away from you and gets red shifted. And they didn't include that mm -hmm. because the director, Christopher Nolan, said, uh, you know, no one is going to understand what's going on with the red shift <laughs> and the blue shift. We're just going to make it like this. And and also, there's lens flare here, which you wouldn't see in uh, a spaceship. But that's OK, because it looks like what you're used to seeing in movies. How many of you saw this movie, Interstellar? I'm not surprised. Good part of this crowd. What did you guys think of it? Uh, I mean, it was, wasn't it remarkable to see that much relativity happening in a, a popular piece of cinema? Jeff? Well, yes, you know, and I, and I think we were talking earlier tonight, you know, last fall we had Interstellar, we had The Imitation Game, and we had Theory of Everything, three of the biggest movies of the season, all with very deep science themes, and the public came out and bought tickets, and they became big hits, and so hopefully Hollywood noticed that science is a good thing to base movies on, and maybe we'll see more of it. You, you get paid to advise those folks uh, in Hollywood. No. To oh. <laughs> I advise those folks in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Do not get paid. Oh, I thought you did. I got, I got a bottle of wine once, <laughs> and I got a sweatshirt that says Iron Man on it. I That's been my, my I, total I payment you, so far. I hope far. you get invited to the premieres at least. It's, uh, no. Now, look, you, you're... Apparently not a Hollywood producer, since you don't know how <laughs> no, this works. Not like, for years now. Yeah. The screenwriter is lucky to get invited to the <laughs> premiere. The uh, <laughs> the science consultant is not. That's not going to be how it works. Yeah. So the time that, that Kip Thorne had making this movie, and you know, if you remember the blackboards in the movie that you know Michael Caine was uh, had behind his desk, that Kip Thorne actually filled out. Real formulas, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I filled out blackboards full of formulas for. Uh, <laughs> for I did one for uh, literally a floor cleaner uh, commercial for a floor cleaner sparkle, and uh, <laughs> I did one for an episode of Bones TV show blackboards. You know, and um, physicist was accused of murdering his daughter. He was innocent, by the way. <laughs> Thank God. But uh, they needed equations, and it's hilarious because the physicist was played by Richard Schiff who is a famous actor, he was Toby on the West Wing. And you know what, as yeah. brilliant of an actor as he is, he cannot write on a blackboard. Just like, just write the letter G with a little superscript, that was really hard for him to do. <laughs> so I was glad I was there on the set, making sure that the equations looked. Hollywood Confidential here right. in the middle That's of right. the relativity yeah. night. <laughs> um, have you found Hollywood to be somewhat receptive to putting science real science into their movies. I think it's changing, actually. Uh, soon after I moved to LA, um, so eight years ago or so, you know, I was at a party, and uh, it was actually a, a birthday party for a friend of mine who was a TV writer. So there were other right TV writers in the room, and we started talking to one of them, and, and you know, he found out it was me and my wife, so she's a science writer, I'm a scientist, and when he found out that we were science-oriented, he, he, he confessed he wanted to run away because he knows that people watch his show and make fun of all the science mistakes. And there's a certain belief in Hollywood that scientists are scolds, that they are copy editors, that they like finding mistakes, and they're annoying and should be avoided. So what we are trying to do, and there's a whole National Academy of Sciences organization called the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which helps to uh, provide useful, constructive science consulting to TV and, and movies, we're trying to send the message that if you talk to the right scientists in the right way, they can actually be useful. They can actually help with ideas. That science is not really about, here's a laundry list of facts that you better get right. Science is an ultimately creative process. It's puzzle solving. It's trying to figure out a theory that makes sense of the data. So if your data is, there's this guy from Asgard who has a really heavy hammer, come up with a scientific theory that explains that. That is the kind of thing that a scientist can actually do. 
And you came close uh, when you were advising the people who made Thor? They didn't care about the hammer. Yeah, you know, they're, they're like, that's magic. <laughs> but they had questions. So, you know, the uh, Jeffrey's example of, of Australia turned out to be relevant. Like, you were polite enough to say people in first and second grade have an intuition. Uh, so do some people in Hollywood have the same intuition. <laughs> they had a plan for a scene in the original Thor movie where they had a planet that instead of being a sphere, it was a disk. And there was a fight between the Asgardian gods and the frost giants that went right up to the edge, and then people would fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and the scientists were like, what? How, the, what? how is the gravity coming? You know, there's nothing there pulling it. And we convinced them to not do that. So that was the triumph. <laughs> nice work. But much more importantly, the character that Natalie Portman played in Thor, Jane Foster, in the comic book, she's a nurse. In the movie, she's an astrophysicist. And you don't, it doesn't come across as strongly as it could, but she is. And that's what takes her out to the desert to look at these strange atmospheric phenomena in the first place and, and leads to discovering Thor and so forth. And, you know, I can give any number of public talks and do podcasts and whatever, but the number of 12-year-old girls who are going to watch a movie like that and go like, hey, that's, she's like some kind of scientist. I want to learn more about that. You know, that's more people than I can ever reach. This is actually an excellent segue into where I want to go next with this. And that is when people should learn about relativity. Jeff, I know it's something you feel very strongly about. When should humans be introduced to these concepts? Well, at, at a very young age, you know, I think, um, again, we would feel bad for someone who wasn't taught that Earth is a planet going around the sun as opposed to being the center of the universe. And if, if we had kids growing up thinking that Earth was the center of the universe and we didn't tell them differently until they became physics majors, we would think that was a bad idea. But we're allowing that to happen with the nature of space, time, and gravity. We're allowing people to grow up thinking that there's something very different from what they are unless they become physics majors. And I think that we should change that. It should be part of general education. You know, Obviously, in elementary school, you're not going to do the equations of general relativity, they're in Sean's graduate level textbook. But that doesn't mean we have to, we can't tell you a little bit about it. We don't expect you to be able to do quantum mechanics in elementary school either, but we do expect you to know that the world is made of atoms. And in the same way, we can be teaching kids that the speed of light is, is an absolute, that you can't go faster, that, that space and time do depend on, on how you're moving. You can start teaching these ideas. I've done it with elementary school kids starting in third and fourth grade, and oftentimes, they're much less troubled by these ideas than grown-ups are, I think because it's only been a couple years since they had to deal with the common sense of the up and down thing. They're like, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> up and down weren't what I thought. Space and time aren't what I thought. Fine, I'll tell me the details as I get older. So that young, what should kids be able to do by the time they're in the 12th grade? Can they take on general relativity? Yeah, I'm kind of, of I'm daydreaming now about my textbook being in every high school in the United States. <laughs> I think that would be, be life-changing. But, uh, you know, no, I think that uh, Jeffrey's exactly right. There's no, we're not going to be teaching the math. It's not, you know, you're not doing problem sets. And I think, but this is the, one of the many huge mistakes we make when we teach physics starting in whatever it is, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, is that even in college, people go to college, take a physics course, they're not physics majors. What do we teach them? We take the course that we would teach to physics majors and we water it down. Mm -hmm. And we think that's the only thing that we're gonna do. So a physics major, they're gonna take a course in their first year, but we know they're also gonna take courses in their second and third and fourth. So we don't need to teach them relativity and quantum mechanics when they get there. They'll get to that eventually. But the, the students who are going to be history majors, they're going to be subjected to a semester of inclined planes and pendulums, and I would be deadly bored if that's were, was what I thought physics was. I think that, yeah, you know, junior high school, high school, introductory college classes should be all about the Big Bang and black holes and quantum field theory and interpretations of quantum mechanics and uh, modern material science and atomic physics. And, you know, there's a whole he there's reasons why we do this for a living, and it's so much fun. Yeah. Is that... I mean, yes, it's fun if it's taught right. But, and I've spent the whole night asking leading questions, so I'm going to ask one more. What's the benefit? Why should kids who are probably not going to become cosmologists or uh, relativity theorists, 
why should they know this stuff? I mean, I could easily ask as well, why should they know about atoms? Well, I can give you my four reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the first one is, is, is relativity is our modern understanding of space, time, and gravity, which is just about everything. So it does affect you in your life through the electronics, all the things we've talked about before. Um, the second reason is also one we've talked about already, which is this idea that you should have a worldview that's based on reality. And we're allowing much of the public, much of kids, to grow up with this equivalent, modern-day equivalent of still thinking Earth is the center of the universe. So we'd be better off if everyone had this understanding on which to base. You know, it's not going to tell you what you should believe about the universe. It's not going to tell you what your religion should be or whether you should have a religion. But at least whatever you think about, what you do believe, you'll say, okay, it ties in with reality instead of tying in with this fantasy world of absolute space and time. Uh, my third reason is, is human potential. This is incredible stuff that Einstein figured out. And it really shows what we're capable of as a species when we put our minds to doing things that are constructive rather than destructive. And that's a lesson that a lot of people could use to, uh, to absorb real well. And I, I don't know if I have time to go to my fourth reason because it's a little more philosophical. But um, Go ahead. Do it. <laughs> what the hell? We got to have... No, we have 23 minutes, yeah. <laughs> but not for that. So, so, you know, you're nice people out here, I think. Um, you all look like nice people, but maybe when you were, you know, in first grade or something, you had a mean streak, and, and you whacked the kid sitting next to you one time, and the kid screamed, and the teacher, well, what, what's going on? You said, hey, not me. And um, uh, you, got away, you got away with it. And so here you are, you know, much longer, you got away with that little event. And you think you got away with it. But remember, in those of you who saw the movie Interstellar, there's that bookcase hmm. inside the black hole, right? So that, of course, is <laughs> fiction. But the reality that it's getting at is this idea that space-time is the same for everyone. Space-time is real. And space-time, you can move in principle through time as well as space. So that event where you hit the kid in first grade, it's, it's an event in space-time. It exists. It didn't go away because go away doesn't mean anything in space-time because time is just a dimension that you move through like space. So if there are four-dimensional beings, I don't know what it means for them to move through space-time since time how do, you, how do you visualize that? But whatever they are, in principle, they could go look, and, and there you are. In space-time, you didn't get away with it. It's there. It's permanent. It's your permanent record. And I kind of believe that if everyone understood this, that everything you do in your life leaves a permanent, indelible mark in space-time, maybe we would all actually behave a little bit better because mm. we would want to leave a mark that looks good rather than one that looks bad. So this is, you know, maybe I'm being quite naive, but I think if everyone understood relativity, we'd be nicer to each other. Wow. <laughs> because Matthew McConaughey is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, this makes me think of something, um, and I'm not very far into it yet, in your other book about time, uh, where you talk about what apparently is more the Greek understanding, the ancient Greek understanding of time, which is somewhat different from ours, where it's kind of sneaking up on us. There's a little bit of uh, philosophy at the beginning of the book, because this is exactly a kind of philosophical question that makes uh, sense to tackle both using science and philosophy. So what uh, Jeffrey was just advocating was a point of view called eternalism. And this is a point of view that is very compatible with the best laws of physics as we currently understand them. That, and Einstein himself advocated this view that there's no fundamental difference between the past, the present, and the future. There's a set of different moments in the history of the universe. You happen to be experiencing one of those right now, but all the moments in the past, all the moments yet to come are just as real as our current one. This is not, as you might uh, be unsurprised to hear, the only point of view on the nature of time. There are presentists who think that only the present is real, and they're like half presentists, and the Greeks were kind of like this, like the past is in the books. The past is done. It's there. We're in the present, but the future is up for grabs.
The future has not yet happened. So there's this point of view that, you know, we, we think of moving forward into time. The Greeks sort of thought of it almost like rowing a, a boat and you see what is behind you. you. You can see the past. You don't see the future, but that's where you're going. We are almost to the point where I'm going to let uh, a few of you folks get in on the conversation. And that is our audience Q&A, of course, when we will allow you to raise your hand and one of the great folks here at the Crawford Family Forum will come over with a microphone and they, they're so kind, they will hold it for you. I will ask you, please start thinking about your question now and start thinking about how to make it as succinct, as brief as you possibly can. And please make sure it's a question. And uh, we won't probably get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can in a few minutes. As we prepare for that, let me throw one more, a uh, little, not really philosophical one at you, but, and it's something we've talked a little bit about, and that is this guy, Al, Albert Einstein. Um, <laughs> uh, are we right to think of him, to place him on that pedestal that so many of us have placed him on? Is his genius... Uh, as worthy of admiration as uh, Time Magazine and so many of us uh, think he is. Who wants to get in? You know, I uh, have an office at Caltech, and the desk that I sit at used to be Richard Feynman's desk. Mm, wow. So I know about hero worship in science, because <laughs> if you go to Caltech, uh, I mean, they, we used to have a bookstore at Caltech, but now there's no longer books, so we don't have a bookstore anymore. It's like two shelves of books. One shelf is books by Caltech authors, and the other shelf is Feynman books. <laughs> That's, and you can understand why Murray Gelman left, because he's like, you know, he was a little bit of a rival. But, so I don't want to idolize Albert Einstein. I don't want to put him on a pedestal. I want to admire what he did. And, you know, frankly, as physicists, as scientists, we are extraordinarily fortunate that the greatest scientist of the 20th century was also a pretty good guy. You know, mm. he was actually pretty admirable in many, many ways. He was, you know, he fought for peace and justice. Uh, he was good as a physicist in many different ways. Like, he wasn't just hyper-specialized in one thing or another. Um, he was not perfect in any sense. Like, you read some of the letters he wrote to his ex-wives. You know, he was, he had his bad moments. He was so, human. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was very human, and I think that's okay. It's okay to be human. It doesn't, just because you're smarter than everybody else, doesn't mean we should put you on a pedestal. We should admire and respect what you've accomplished. And what Albert Einstein accomplished was certainly worthy of being the person of the century. Jeff, person of the century or meh? Uh, no, he's, I think he, he's well-deserved. I mean, he has a little bit of an advantage in that he started his work right at the beginning of the century. So he had the full <laughs> hundred years for the, for the impact of his work to become really clear. Like if you did something like 1998 discover the acceleration of the uh, cosmos. It could be that 100 years from now that might seem comparable, but you know it only had two years at the time. So you know, but but yes, he, what he did was really amazing, and it's the way he thought, the way he went about it, that that was very different from the way other scientists were looking at the same kinds of questions, and it changed the way other scientists work, and um, you know. Oh, there's been many great scientists, Feynman and so on, and you could have a debate about whose impact is the greatest, but there's certainly no reason to quibble with Einstein having done incredible things for the human species mm. and things that made a huge difference in all of our lives. Of course, he didn't play the bongo, so Feynman has him there. Played violin. <laughs> Vi yeah, violin. There's the joke that he, you know, right. he was famous because he was Einstein, so he got to play violin along with you know some famous really, really good musician playing uh, piano. And at some point, you know, the, the pianist just had to stop and said, Professor Einstein, you have no understanding of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all relative. <laughs> OK, let's do go out to the audience here at the Crawford Family Forum. Already a few hands up. And I think we're going to come to you, sir, right on the aisle here. Hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Todd Kerner from Hermosa Beach. And as we go careening into another presidential season, uh, a popular refrain among politicians is, well, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know that. <laughs> so I know it does a disservice just to our general understanding of science, but what would you recommend that these politicians say in regards to the questions that seem to stump them? Excuse me, before you, either of you respond, allow me to spit, please. <laughs> okay. I, 
Well, I'm not a scientist, but... You can enjoy music without being Mozart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's the first time this uh, politician says, I'm no scientist, but I'm also not an idiot, so I'm going to listen to what the scientists tell me about science. We should vote for them. <laughs> All right. Please. Fair enough. Let's go to the way in the back there. Hi. Please tell us who you are. Oh, Hannah. Um, I was wondering what the state is of gravity wave detection, since ah, you brought up gravity we were, quite a bit. That and came up just before we got started here. Are, are we getting close, Sean? Yeah, it's going to happen. It's gonna, I, would, I would easily bet it even money that in the next five years, we will discover gravitational waves. All right. So give us some is, background. This is a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, the, you know, we, we started off with the spooky action at a distance stuff, right? And in Newtonian gravity, if you take a, a star and move it, the, now its gravity is pointing in a different direction. And according to Newton, that effect, that difference in where the gravity is pointing, propagates instantly throughout the entire universe. Whereas Einstein says if you move something, there's a ripple in space-time that that sort of moves out in a sphere away from the object that you moved, and that's a gravitational wave, a ripple in the curvature of space-time. So we know that they're there. They're predicted by Einstein, and we've also indirectly seen their effects. We've seen star systems with two neutron stars orbiting around each other lose energy and get closer and closer because they're emitting these gravitational waves. We've already given away a Nobel Prize for that. But gravity is a very weak force, so we've never directly detected an individual gravitational wave here on Earth. We've built telescopes, observatories, that are trying, but they haven't quite been good enough yet. The LIGO telescope in particular, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, has been observing for quite a while, but they very recently turned it off, took it apart, re-put it together with higher precision instruments. Now we have advanced LIGO, that is coming online in a couple of years. I'd be more surprised than not uh, if we actually didn't detect the gravitational waves directly. All right. Let's go back out here for at least one or two more. Back on the other side of the Crawford Family Forum. Hi, sir. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Louis Gonkels. I actually was a student at Caltech. Oh. So very nice to talk here. Um, so Newton's gravity was absurd. But it gave you the right answer, so people just calculated and didn't worry about it until 400 years later. Somebody did worry about it, came up with something better. So what's the chances that uh, quantum mechanics is our current absurdity that, you know, eventually somebody will come up with something better than that? Such a good question. I mean, you physicists, you talked about how you're all about wanting to unify things, right? Uh, haven't quite gotten there with gravity, have we? No. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, there's two things going on. We don't understand what you're referring to is the idea that we don't know how to reconcile quantum mechanics with gravity. But the question points out that we don't even understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> so forget about <laughs> unifying it with gravity. Um, and it's a mess. You know, I, I've said in public that the fact that, number one, we don't understand quantum mechanics, and number two, we're not more outraged by that is the greatest embarrassment in modern theoretical physics. There are some of us who really think that it's worth thinking about. Um, there's been a, a certain attitude. There's almost a, you know, the, the fox and the grapes, the Aesop's fable, where you know, the fox tries to get the grapes and doesn't succeed and then says, well, they were probably sour anyway. So the grapes are understanding quantum mechanics. <laughs> and the fox is modern physicists. And we like, <laughs> well, we tried to understand it. It, we didn't really succeed, maybe we don't need to understand it. I think that's a very bad attitude. <laughs> but I also think that the experiments that we're doing right now are pushing us into a regime where the back of the envelope textbook unsatisfying version of quantum mechanics is no longer good enough. I, I really do think that I, I would, again, be very surprised if I'm, I'm putting my beliefs on, on the line here. 50 years from now, we'll understand quantum mechanics. Hmm. Jeff is... Or Please. I, I, he said that was the uh, most embarrassing thing for, for physicists there. So as an astronomer, I'll say the most embarrassing thing is that if you ask me what the universe is made of, I'll say 5% atoms and the other 95% this dark matter and dark energy. But what are they? Well, I don't know. Um, sorry. So 95% of the universe, we don't know what it is, which, you know, we have all these ideas that we've built in this modern 
model of modern cosmology in which we kind of just assume that dark matter will turn out to be this particle and dark energy will turn out to be the cosmological constant and everything will be just fine. Um, but since we haven't figured them out yet, it's possible that it won't be just fine, that it will mm -hmm. overturn our ideas of the universe as much as relativity did. And so until we figure it out, you know, I wouldn't place my bets there. And wouldn't that be cool? Of course it would be cool. I mean, every physicist alive would like to be the one to show that Einstein was wrong. You know, this is how <laughs> physics works. Like, we love Einstein, but we're... I've proposed alternatives to general relativity. They're, they're not as good. Einstein was pretty smart, you know? But, but I, I actually, I do not think it's an embarrassment that we don't <laughs> understand dark matter and dark energy. I remember being on the radio on Science Friday, and Ira Flato said, like, you cosmologists, shouldn't you be embarrassed that you don't understand 95% of the universe? And, and my response was, we understand 5% of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. 100 years ago, we understood 0% of the universe. What do you want from us? Give us a couple hundred more years, we'll understand it. Or at and least 7 or 8%. Let me give a, a slightly different take on the Einstein <laughs> being wrong part, too, because I, a lot of people in the public, I think, get... get a misunderstanding of the way science works sometimes because we say, you know, Einstein proved Newton wrong. Well, he didn't prove Newton wrong. Mm. Newton was perfectly right for everything that he was able, that we were able to test experimentally at the time. And for those things, Newton's theory still gives yeah. the right answers. Yeah. What, we, what Einstein really showed is that Newton's theory wasn't the entire story. There was more to it. And in the same way, I, you know, general relativity has been tested and tested and tested. It's passed all those tests. And there's nothing you can ever do to make that evidence go away. Einstein's theory works in the realms where it's been tested. The question is who will figure out whether it's the entire story or whether there is a bigger theory out there that broadens it more. We have time for one more. Quick question. Quick answers as well. I guess we should go back over to this side. Hi there. What's your name? My name is Eric Thomas. Uh, I work with Lyndon LaRouche. Um, I had a question uh, specifically about Einstein's method because you guys keep bringing up that Einstein had a revolutionary approach. And from my look with looking at Einstein, it really is he emphasized constantly creative reason. He wasn't big on deducing from mathematical formulas. He wasn't simply trying to derive from you know, observation. But he really had this point where he said that imagination was more important than knowledge. That causality could Got to ask you to get to a question real yeah. fast. So I just wanted to get your view on that. Yeah, imagination is not more important than knowledge. That's a silly thing to think. I think you need everything. I mean, the way that science works is a dialectic. You go back and forth. You have ideas, you say, well, this idea would mean something about the physical world, and then you go look at the physical world. You see if it, if it, if it uh, fits that idea. Usually it doesn't fit that idea, and you have to go and, and update your idea, the hypothetico-deductive method. And Einstein was smarter than your average physicist, and so he was able to go really far just with the logical interdependence of the ideas themselves. But even he you know, needed the... the the inspiration of the data to know that special relativity was right, that Maxwell's equations were right for electromagnetism. You know, we all, no physicist in history has figured out what the world is like just by thinking about it. And Einstein said the happiest moment of his life was after having worked on general relativity for about eight years, tr going through just the logic, just the imagination part of it, he calculated the orbit of Mercury and found that it matched the one really known discrepancy with Newton's theory, and that was when he knew that his time had not been wasted, that he was on the right track. So it was that evidence-based test of the imagination that was critical to him. So here's the question I thought somebody was going to ask, probably the next person I would have called on. If it's not full of bookshelves, what's inside a black hole? <laughs> Never mind. I don't it's even want It's empty space. It's, you know, there's <laughs> nothing there. It's space time. That's the wonderful thing, that a black hole is not a thing. You don't, as far as we know, when you cross the event horizon of a black hole, you don't even know. You're just in a, it's a region of the universe that is a point of no return. Once you get there, you can never come out. Which poses an interesting dilemma for science, because that means you can never tell anybody what you found in there. So it's not observable. And, and in as, science, we need to observe. As you fall into the black hole, the, the, there is, until you cross that boundary, there's still light that comes from you. But one of Einstein's predictions is that there is a redshift. There's a gravitational redshift. Mm. So the light that is coming from you that your friends 
are seeing gets redder and redder as if you're sort of embarrassed to have done something as dumb as falling into a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> also something Jeff uh, uh, goes into in great detail in his book. Interestingly, in both of your most recent books, uh, they close with very similar chapters. I don't know if you're aware of that. They both build the case for basic research and public understanding of science. And we've done a good deal of that. I hope we've done a good deal of that as we've talked here today. John, I was, I was particularly struck by a quote in your book, The Particle at the End of the Universe, from Robert Wilson. Uh, and I want to read it, but would you put it in context first? Robert Wilson was uh, an experimental particle physicist, a great physicist and uh, one of the very few physicists who was also a great manager. He was a great you know, project director, a bit of a crazy person. He carried around a shotgun uh, and so forth, but he was put in charge of building the great American particle physics laboratory, Fermilab, outside Chicago. And uh, so this is like late 60s, I, I think. And it requires a lot of money. The Department of Energy uh, was in charge of it. So he had to testify before Congress. And the, the congressman, it was the 1960s, you know, it was the Cold War. They were willing to spend money. The physicists had done great things. They built the bomb. They were, you know, it was clear that physics was important for national security. So this sympathetic congressman was trying to give Wilson the opportunity to say, we need to build Fermilab in order to protect national security for the sake of national defense. So they said, you know, Professor Wilson, why should we be spending all this money to build this? What is the point? So here's the quote. After Wilson a couple of times said, nope, there's no defense angle, right? Yeah, and he said his, his first answer was, you know, what does this contribute to national security? Nothing. <laughs> and the congressman is like, you know, no, no, really. Like, <laughs> <laughs> try again. Like, so what does this really help us defend our nation? And he's like, no, it's not really to do that. And then he gets a third chance. So here's what Wilson says. And apply this in this case, not just to particle physics, but basic research. It has only to do with the respect with which we regard e one another, the dignity of man, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? I mean, all the things we really venerate in this country and are pa patriotic about, it has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to make it worth defending. Jeff, judging from what you said about uh, your philosophical points, and, and you do talk about this at the end of the book, I bet you agree. I totally agree with that. So basic research for its own sake, except that we do get a payoff. I mean, it does pay for itself, even in that bottom line sense that, you know, the Office of Management and Budget probably cares about, right? I mean, it, it's not maybe the, the most emotional reason for doing it, but I mean, both of you talk about this as well. Sean, it's in the close of your book, talking about building you know, big science like the LHC. Yeah, it, it, it pays off, it pays back. You know, every dollar we put into basic research gets the, you know, improves the economy by more than a dollar back, but it's not why we do it. Yeah. Jeff, you have this great formula for, um, we were talking about it, I think, uh, at dinner, uh, about what it might do, and this came up earlier as well, if a few more people end up going to college. Well, we were talking about uh, sp space exploration, human exploration of space, and you know, from my children's books, I want to see us go back to the moon, I want to see us go on to Mars, and people will ask, well, what, what good is that? You know, what's the economic return? Well, you can do the spin-off arguments, but my economic argument is the inspiration argument. If you get 1% more of America, if you take the percentage of Americans who get a college education from 29% to 30%, that's 3 million more people with a college degree, according to the, uh, the statistical um, e economics, the average college graduate will earn a million dollars more over their lifetime than a high school graduate. So 3 million more people with a college degree earning a million more dollars over their lifetime is a $3 trillion return for that 1% of inspiration. Not a bad rate of return. Last of my real questions, you two guys, you could probably be perfectly happy not appearing you know, on stages, on camera, getting asked uh, silly, oversimplified questions by tiresome hosts. Uh, why is it so personally important to the two of you to make this a part of uh, your valuable 
time here on Earth. Jeff? Well, well my favorite quotation, since you asked, is from H.G. Uh, Wells in 1920 when he said, human history is more and more a race between education and catastrophe. And I think that he, he's really captured the essence of it when you think about all the things that we deal with in modern society. We could easily be on the verge of catastrophe unless we get the education out there soon enough for people to respond intelligently. So uh, for me, this is what it's all about. I want to be part of the winning team, and I want the winning team to be the education. Sean, why are you here tonight and all the other nights you've spent doing this kind of stuff? Yeah, I was uh, 10 years ago when we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of special relativity. I, I gave a talk, and I came home afterward, and I actually went out to a sports bar to watch a football game because my TV was not working. And the, the table next to mine was this birthday party, this group of women who had come in, and they were rooting for the wrong team, the team that I was not <laughs> working. But so, like, we were clearly rooting against each other, and, and <clears throat> they started talking, and at halftime, they asked me what I did and whatever, and this one woman says, you know, I said, cosmology, physics, and this one was like, why? Why are we doing this? What is, why would anyone do that? And before I could give my potted answer, her sister, who was at the table, interjected, and she said, you know, she was an elementary school teacher. And she says, well, what I tell my kids is, because the world is not magic. The world makes sense if we can only understand it at a deep level. And that privilege of getting paid to think about how the world works, you know, I don't do it to make a better iPhone or to cure a disease or anything like that. It's only because we want to know the workings of the world. So what would be the point for me to do this, to figure this stuff out, and then not tell anybody. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this is our shared common human heritage. This is not something for a bunch of people. It's not proprietary knowledge. It's not something that only the specialist should understand. Everyone should know. Space-time is curved. The universe is expanding. Most of the universe is made of dark stuff. Any year now, we're going to detect gravitational waves. <laughs> I'll count on it. We're ready to wrap up. Jeff, we got one more slide. You've already done nearly 20 of these relativity uh, tour appearances. And, you know, this is what's coming up. More for our online audience, none in this area. But if people want to get you to come, you know, out their way or learn more about the relativity tour or other stuff that you're up to, what, what should they know? Well, they should email me and let me know because there's a, quite a few more than you see on, this, on the uh, screen right now lined up. So I have a uh. very few slots left for the rest of the year because this is the year, right, for the 100th anniversary. So it's relativity tour this year. Next year will be something else. Um, <laughs> and um, it's going to be the I Am Not a Scientist global warming tour, by the way. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert. I I'm serious. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, first talk will be in Boulder in October. And, um, my boss is writing a book about that right now, Bill Nye. Well, that, yeah, that's probably why my book got rejected. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, but I could still do my talking. So, um, But yes, the relativity tour, it's been really fun because, you know, I've given talks on lots of topics before. And at Fisk Planetarium Boulder, they have 250 seats. And I've been always really happy if we got 150 to 200 filled. And when I showed up for the first talk this year, at the time, I normally get there a half hour before everybody, and there was a line around the building. I was like, wow. And somebody, one of my friends told me, it's not for you. It's for the guy there on the bicycle. <laughs> um, but everybody's heard of relativity. Everybody's heard of Einstein, and most people don't know why. And so I think that's been drawing a lot of people out. And mm. hopefully, uh, hopefully this will make a difference that more people will know about it now. Gives me hope. Sean, what do we need to know about what you're up to and uh, what you're going to be doing next? Well, you know, we've talked about uh, does relativity or, or these great ideas have an influence on our everyday lives. And in terms of, like, technology and building a better TV set, the answer is no. But it is the universe. It is our universe. We're made of the same stuff as the stars and the galaxies are. And so when I give talks on physics and cosmology, you know, the, the people who don't know they're supposed to be asking about dark matter and dark energy, they want to know, like... How does it all fit together? What does this mean for what I am? What is, what is my role in this vast cosmos with 100 billion galaxies with 100 billion stars each? So I am finally writing a book about exactly that uh, that'll be coming out next year. It's called The Big Picture. And the subtitle is On the Origin of Life, Meaning, and the Universe Itself. And it'll be connecting 
our everyday lives that we live uh, from day to day to the underlying laws of physics, how the world works, how we learn about it, how life began, how we should make sense of it all. I look forward to reading it. I hope you folks have had as much fun as I have had tonight. We are running a little bit late. Just a few more things to say, but first, help me thank our guests for an utterly fascinating and inspiring evening. They are author Jeff Bennett of Big Kid Science and Caltech professor of physics and author Sean Carroll. We'll be back before too long with another one of these next People Science Tomorrow programs here at Southern California Public Radio's Crawford Family Forum. I don't know, maybe we'll talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that just got a hundred million dollar boost. I don't know, we'll come up with something fun. As always, I want to thank the outstanding staff here at the Crawford Family Forum for making this evening such great fun. Amazing support that they provide. They include producer Janice Wachi Hurst, Liz Brown, Dave McKeever, Haley Waters, Jason and Clara Georges, Haley Waters, Lauren Moon, and Emily Guerra. The managing producer of live events for SCPR is the relatively cool, relatively handsome John Cohn. <laughs> and thanks to all of you here in the Crawford Family Forum and those of you who've been watching us online tonight, I'm Matt Kaplan. Good night, everybody. <laughs>